when it comes to studying Torah, Rav Cook believes it should be the most personal thing um, and not just attaining information. So, Levi, I'm going to read with you a piece. This is from Orota Torah, originally. In my book, it's on page 26. Um, and originally, it was written um, in a booklet he wrote in Boisk, which was in Europe. And, um, okay, so I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's quite long. Well, not really very long, <laughs> but too long for this recording. But I want to get to the main part. Now, I want just as a small introductory, a lot of people think it's kind of passed down that this piece is referring to Bialik, um, who was... Um, a colleague, a friend, a contemporary of Rav Kook, a student of Rav Kook, um, who went to the Vlaj and Yeshiva. And um, he was younger than Rav Kook. He went to the Vlaj and Yeshiva at a different time to Rav Kook. Um, and uh, when he left the Yeshiva, a few years later, he stopped keeping halakha and being religious. And so Bialik became famous for writing this book called Sefer Agadah and also for being a poet. And so Rav Kook, I guess, many years later was thinking to himself, how could such a spiritual person um, who loves studying the stories in the Talmud um, and loved writing poetry and was a you know, very, very sensitive soul, why was he turned off um, Torah and mitzvot? And so this piece, many people think, is whenever it's referring to the person who loves Agadah, it's referring to Bialik. Okay. Many people have left religion because in their learning and spiritual perfection, they betrayed their unique personalities. For example, a person may be naturally talented in matters of Agadah and be unsuited to constant immersion in the matters of Halakha. Yet because he does not recognize his unique talents, he occupies himself in matters of Gemara and its commentaries, since he sees that this is customary in the religious world today. But deep inside his soul, he feels a hatred toward the material he is learning, since constant involvement in it does not suit his unique natural gifts. However, if he were to find the specific type of Torah that fits his unique talents and immerse himself in it, he would then immediately recognize that the nauseating feeling he experienced when involved in matters of halakha was not coming from any flaw in that holy and important type of learning. It was rather his soul expressing its desire to be absorbed in another type of Torah. This person would then stay truly faithful to the Torah and become an expert in the type of Torah that is unique to him. In fact, he would even be able to help those who are more talented in halakha by showing them the inner piece of agadah, poetry and emotions. Unfortunately, because this person does not recognize the true reasons for his feelings of nausea towards halakha, he forcefully ignores his nature. And as soon as the path of a non-Torah way of life opens up to him, he breaks out and then hates and becomes an enemy of Torah and religion. He will go from one sin to another. It is from these types of people that haters of our people created. They try to proclaim a new vision and blind the eyes of the world. There is a great diversity of wisdom that expands even greater than this. One may be strongly attracted to a certain secular wisdom. Such a person must also follow his unique talents while setting aside fixed times for learning Torah. If he does this, then he will succeed in both because Torah together with the way of the world is beautiful. And the Gemara at the end of Yuma discusses how to find the right balance of priorities for such people. In general, this whole issue is dependent on each person's unique soul. Levi. Any thoughts on this? It's a very provocative, powerful piece. I mean, I think it's an incredible piece. Um, I think it, it is most uh, you know, phenomenal in how it builds. It starts with the problem that people leave because they have betrayed who they are, that the process of learning Torah requires betraying you know, who I am and what I'm good at, what I'm interested in, etc. And then he talks about that, like, the possible fix, that if the person could really learn the parts of the Torah that interest them, that'd be great. That's not like how people study Torah today, so therefore they, he's sort of gone back to the problem. And then when he, the last paragraph, he makes like, it's like a jump over the initial, like, where he starts off by saying, you know, everyone has a part of Torah that they could be interested in, and denying yourself that and focusing on the, the parts of Torah you're not interested in caused like you problems and cause problems in your relationship with religion and Torah, etc. Uh, but then suddenly in this last paragraph, he says, who you are doesn't just give you a specific interest and connection to certain parts of Torah. It is a certain part of anything. that You, even outside the world of Torah, have things that interest you and things that you're connected to, and you have to go find them. Not just that you um, could or should, not just saying the, uh, you know, the world of the secular world is kosher or not trade because it's a mitzvah um, in a sense there's a, a traditional debate about whether or not there's devil or shoot if there's things that you're 
allowed to do but don't have to do, or if really everything in the world falls into the categories of commanded and forbidden. Yeah. And Rav Cook is saying here is that like the things you can do, that you want to do, you almost have to do, at least enough to sort of satisfy who you are. Yeah, and, and the thing about the ending, which is what you said, which he's really saying, you know, there are secular wisdoms out there. In other words, a person wants to become a doctor. You have to follow that desire inside of you feel that that's a spiritual endeavor or you're really excited about business that is part of avodat hashem you know a connection to hashem but let's go back to the beginning of the piece because i think it's just so powerful um when it comes to studying torah i guess just i think this is true about all education we just see it as a very impersonal endeavor um there's information to be learned how can i get it into my mind in the best way i'll do a test i'll memorize it um i'll get a mark and that's it and for Rav Cook, education is so not that. Education, specifically Torah learning in this piece, um, is about self-discovery and, and, and finding ideas that open your soul to a part of itself. And so for a person who loves learning Agadah, what is Agadah? Agadah um, is literally, it's the things in the Gemara that are talking about stories, but he uses it here to symbolize really anything spiritual. So you could include in learning Hasidut, Rabbi Nachman, the Baal Shem Tov, the Tanya. This could also include learning, I would say, um, you know, the mystical parts of the Tanakh, um, stories in the Tanakh, anything not legal, halachic. And if you have this very ex- deep excitement inside of your soul to learn about the philosophy, the meaning, the purpose of Judaism, and you're surrounded by a religious environment that thinks that's, you know, fluff, uh, if you need it, extra stuff, dessert, um, then what's going to happen inside of you is very traumatic. And he really describes this person who ignores his personality, his soul, and just learns dry, practical Judaism, um, and it really hurts him, and eventually, or her, and eventually it will push them off Judaism altogether. So maybe you can talk a little bit, um, maybe your own, you know, your, your own journey towards finding, because I know you're, you're very passionate about you know, Jewish philosophy today, and mysticism, and also Tanakh. Was that, was that a journey you had to get to, to find that that Torah was your... Your chelak, your, your portion, or was it immediate? You realize that. Um, well, or maybe you disagree with me altogether. It's not your. <laughs> no, it's um, look, it, Jewish philosophy and mysticism is absolutely my chelak, as it were. Uh, <laughs> and Rav Shigar, like, your specific. <laughs> it's a question of the the like chronology of my journey. Um, doesn't at first involve me knowing that like, oh, that's what I would like to learn, but I'm not finding it. Um, I went to a high school where there was like no such thing. I would, when I went back there later after Yeshiva, I saw that like in, in the Baby Rush, there was a Svatimet and like a Rebbe Tzadok, but that was it and nobody was learning them. <laughs> um, and I really, by the time I finished um, studying there, I didn't know there was more to Judaism than the Mishnah Brura and the Gemara. Um, and that was a very sort of painful experience to me. And so when I came to uh, learn in Israel after high school, I went to Yeshiva Doraita, really just the discovery that there was more to Judaism um, and that there was this whole realm of Jewish philosophy and mysticism and things uh, very much like just, you know, lit a match in my soul, as it were. Like I suddenly found all of these things I was interested in. Um, and after that, I never really went back to a framework where they were going to make me you know, not learn that. I studied at Araita, I studied at the Beit Midrash Sephardi, where very, um, you know, they didn't have shirim mm-hmm. on uh, Jewish philosophy, but as an Avrech, I could sort of learn whatever I wanted. Um, and I studied at Haaretzion, where there's like a strong emphasis on Gemara, but also on Tanakh and on Jewish philosophy, and also lots of freedom to learn whatever I wanted. Um, I really couldn't see myself going to a place that was going to tell me all I could learn was Gemara and Mishnah Bura. Do you find it, um, I mean, even reading it with me right now, do you find it um, refreshing to hear a rabbi be so unapologetically positive towards you searching for a part of the Torah that speaks to you? Um, do you think this is, this, is, this is not heard and not spoken about enough in the, in the, in the religious world? I think it depends on the world. Like, I think there are parts of uh, modern orthodoxy and Datulami world that very much emphasize um, that things should speak to you personally. Um, I think 
in modern orthodoxy, it's an ongoing battle at the moment. And I think there are um, parts of Judaism for whom it's not a battle because no one's even raised the question of like, should you connect to learning personally? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say just because I have a more, I you know, I have a bit of a Haredi background. I spent eight years in Haredi yeshivat. Um, there was just no place for a person who wanted to learn Tanakh, nothing, or there was no place for a person who was excited about learning Hasidut or Musar. The majority of the day of learning was you spent it studying Gemara, um, you know, nine till ten, a little bit of Halakha if you needed it, even that was on the side, <laughs> and then ten till one learning just Gemara, and then, you know, you have a break, you do a bit of Mishnah, and then the rest of the day till seven, or well, let's say 6.30, <laughs> is learning Gemara. And, and if you need at the end of the day, if you feel weak, if you feel you need a bit of idud encouragement, so you can learn a little bit of, you know, Der Hashem or Mesir <laughs> Isharim, which is, you know, a Musa book. But there's just real no, no serious respect for somebody who is searching for a different flavor of Torah and to be encouraged by a rabbi, which is what Rav Cook's doing here to me, um, and, and you know, to anyone who reads his writings, I think it's very refreshing. I think I would even use the word therapeutic. I remember reading this when I was about 23, finding this piece so therapeutic. Wow, here is a rabbi who really wants me to make Judaism personal, and he's not making me feel guilty for parts of Torah that I really, really connect to more than other. Um, yes, yeah, so that's an amazing thing. Um, maybe I'll just add one thing to end here. Um, I think Rav Cook would want everyone, I mean, there's a piece later in the book on the next page um, where he says everyone should learn all the parts of the Torah. They should at least get a taste, a flavor, because how are you going to ever know which flavor is your flavor if you haven't tasted it? So he definitely wants everyone to have seen Gomorrah, have you know, gone through the, the Tanakh, read Mishnayot, read Halakha, but after a while you see that there is something inside of you that is so excited about a certain part of Torah, you should go deeper into that. And it's funny that in the university world, there's just no problem with this, meaning this is so obvious. Obviously, you do a degree, you do a major in something that you like, and when you excel in that, that's your contribution to the world. But in the religious world, I, th I feel like Rav Cook would say, we're, we're behind in this area. We haven't realized that there are many flavors, many ways, many knowledges in the Torah, and that's a stumbling block for people's connection. Well, I also think, um, just because you brought up, like, you know, college, and secular college, that I think it's not as simple as like, oh, you learn whatever you're gonna, you know, uh, enjoy and find it, to take a, you know, you study for a degree and something you're interested in. There's like a serious voice that says, you go to college to get a job. You go to study mm -hmm. something that's gonna make money. I hear. And I think the critique of that, of like, the value of knowing a broad amount of things and, you know, seeing a broad amount of information and ways of thinking um, uh, as a form of, like, building the self and becoming, like, fully human as the humanities um, and things like that um, are very similar to what Rav Cook is trying to bring to Torah study, that it was a very strict, uh, you know, measuring stick for evaluating learning, whether it's Gemara and Halacha or, you know, what makes money then you miss out on both a whole realm of knowledge and a whole realm of human and Jewish experience. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll just end with this one metaphor that I, I put in the introduction to this section um, that I thought about years ago. This, this metaphor came to me that, you know, if someone had never heard of music ever, and let's say an alien came down and, and said, well, I heard, Levi, there's this thing called music. Can you show it to me? And so, you know, you put on classical music and they say, well, I guess I don't like music then. I mean, let's say they didn't like the, the sound of it. You say, wait, 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 and you know, turn on jazz. And they say, well, that sounds better. I still, I guess I don't like music. No, 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 And you turn on rock. They say, well, that sounds good. And then you turn on R&B, hip hop. You keep changing it. Um, folk music, country music, until eventually, wow, that's amazing. That's how you get somebody to fall in love with music. When we say someone's in love with music, we usually don't refer to all music. We refer to an expression of music in a specific realm. So I think in a similar way, when someone says, um, Torah's boring, I, don't, I really don't think I'm elitist in this way. I think th there are so many flavors in the Torah. I mean, if Cook says it even in, in secular knowledge, but I think there's wisdoms that fits people's souls and personalities and some people like more emotional intelligence, some people like more analytical, intellectual, um, some people like stories more, some people like laws more. And Rav Cook really believes that the way to help you fall in love with the word Torah, you know, Torah study, it's a mitzvah, 
is by trying to get the genre right.